Greetings, I'm Brother Judah from the Congregation of Israel, a representative of the NMP, the Nazarene Messianic Party. And today I would like to discuss a subject entitled, Behold the Kingdom of God. Behold the Kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, we want to analyze some things about the appearing of the Kingdom of God, or the coming of the Kingdom of God. Many of us have different variations of the kingdom of God in our imaginations. What I would like to do is go into the text and analyze the coming of the kingdom of God. Some people believe it's going to happen right away. Have it going to break right open. Roll back like a scroll like the book said. And people look at that literally. Uh, I'm here to tell you we probably... If, if, if that happens, that happens. But if it don't happen, then some people might get caught out there. So when you look in that, for example, the Bible talk about the heavens rolling back like a scroll. And uh, the uh, meaning of that, if you look at the imagery of it, he didn't say roll open like a scroll. He said roll back. Closing it. When you're closing a scroll, it's the end of a chapter. It's the end of an age. And people read various passages in the Bible, and I will argue they stumble over these passages because of literalism. Many people have went out their way to call Jesus of Nazareth a liar. Uh, mind you, he was an Israelite, and uh, you got these people who consider themselves Israelites that have, and they think they got more intelligence and more scriptural knowledge than the ancestors. They think they have more scriptural knowledge than Simon and Saul, which was called Paul, and James or Jacob, and Jesus of Nazareth, of Yeshua of, of Nazareth himself. And I'm telling you that these guys who call themselves Israelites today, they, they can't hold a candle. They, they, they can't compare to these Israelites of the, uh, of, of the fathers of the days, ancient days, uh, in context of where we stand today. Meaning, 2,000 years ago, you got these brothers and elders to us. They knew they were Israelites. They studied the scriptures. And we need to learn their language instead of we, who think we're Israelites, proud as hell, man. I mean, pride, I mean, many people call themselves Israelites wear pride like a garment. Meaning, you can't tell them nothing. Jesus is a liar. Paul don't lie. No, the scripture don't say that. Well, you know this and that. Well, you know, we probably need to go in here and let the Bible talk to us. And we want to analyze the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you something while we're looking at this. A lot of, th uh, one thing that people stumble over is the process of time. You know, here in the West, everything is fast. And we, you know, sometimes I ask them, well, how long is the day of Yahweh? How long is the day of Yahuwah? How long will it take for the kingdom of God to come to its fullness? Before you say Jesus of Nazareth lied, do you know his teachings? Uh, do you understand his language as a master teacher? Him speaking in parables. For those who are his students, they are to understand. For those rebels, they are without. They won't understand. Now when we're looking at the kingdom of God, there's something Jesus of Nazareth said in Matthew the 13th chapter that I would like to look at today. Matthew chapter 13 and uh, <clears throat> I think it warrants some consideration. I'm here, to, I'm arguing that the kingdom of God is a progression. And that when, when the, the images we read about today, what I would like for you to do is take into consideration the process of time. It doesn't give you a time, but it gives you an image of something that takes time. What do you mean, Brother Judah? Well, look at this. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, 
the master teacher was giving us some parables to his students. And in Matthew chapter 13, he reveals to us some clues about the kingdom of God. And one of the clues he revealed about the kingdom of God is this. That the kingdom of God is actually a progression. Well, what do you mean, brother? Well, look. Matthew, the 13th chapter, starting at verse 31, it reads, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sold in his field. A mustard seed, a real small mustard seed. I'm telling you, they are small, tiny. And he took this mustard seed and put it in his field. Verse 32 reads, which indeed is the least of all seeds. In other words, it's, one, it's the smallest of all seeds you could plant. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree. So that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now trees and birds come and lodge in the branches this is the language found in the prophets of the growth of an empire or the growth of a kingdom. Okay? And you will find uh, empires and kingdoms and uh, societies as representing cedar trees and, 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 and different birds lodging in these trees representing how these other nations was nourished by these mighty nations or these mighty kingdoms. So the language he's drawn from the prophets about it growing into a tree and birds lodging in it. But I'll ask you a question. How long does it take for the mustard seed to grow into a tree? Not the mustard seed to be planted and it sprouts into a little small flower and that flower sprouts into a stalk that's six feet inches high, a foot, two foot, three foot, how long does it take? When we analyze in the scriptures, we can't, we shouldn't read it like the Greeks. Many people call themselves Israelites today and they want to speak Hebrew and everything, but their mentality is in understanding whether it's English or Greek, the way that they understand the text that they're reading, they understand it from a greco Roman perspective. So the thing is, how long will it take for a mustard seed to grow into a tree? And you say, well, brother, that don't matter. Of course it matters, because the kingdom of God is like that. Not only will it be a shelter for life, but the process for it to grow from a mustard seed to a tree need to be taken into consideration. Now, there's something else here. In the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, this is what I would like to analyze today as well. This is another example of biblical imagery of the kingdom of God. Now, in the book of Daniel, the second chapter, we have Nebuchadnezzar having a dream. And in his dream, he's seen a vision of a, of a colossus image. Gold it was, silver, brass, iron, and iron and clay. And we want to analyze what the prophet Daniel was conveying. Now, in Daniel, the second chapter, verse 1, it reads, it says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Now we and we establish he didn't had a dream. Now let's skip down to verse 17. Verse 17 reads, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Because he had a dream, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. Nobody could interpret the dream. Nobody knew what it meant. He got mad, get, get ready to kill everybody. Now you read the whole story on. But Daniel said, give me some time, and I'll get the understanding of your dream, most high willing. And so he went back and told his companions about the matter. 
and the creator is going to reveal to Daniel what the dream is about. And it's important. We need to know about this dream. We're talking about the kingdom of God here. So we need to know something about this dream. Well, why are you saying that? Notice what we're about to look, look at here. Now, verse 18 says, After he told his companions that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I told you Nebuchadnezzar wanted to kill everybody. But it reads, verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of, of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. So he didn't receive understanding on what this dream was. And he received the interpretation. And it is something that we ought to pay attention to. Daniel chapter 2, and let's skip down to verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers and the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar. What shall be in the latter days thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these? So he's going to start to explain what he's seen. Verse 29. As for thee, O king, Thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So, we all should pay attention on what was revealed to Daniel. This is pertaining to the kingdom of God. Remember the parable already. We have one example of the parable that Jesus of Nazareth gave, or Yahweh. Yahushua of Nazareth gave to his disciples. He said, the kingdom of God like a mustard seed. And it grow into a great tree. That takes time. I want you to realize that. That takes time. It don't happen overnight. It don't happen in just a few weeks. It takes time. And the Bible is teaching us to take into consideration the process of time. Because the God of heaven builds with quality. He isn't in a rush to do anything. Time isn't nothing to him. Okay? So what we're looking at, what may be a long time to us, not much to the Creator. Now, he has revealed this secret, and he's about to explain it to Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm telling, us, telling you all that we ought to pay attention to this. Verse 30 reads, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes, that shall make known the interpretation to the king. And that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This image or this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part clay. Thou sawest till a stone Notice this, he's seen it until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Keep this in mind, because people look at this prophetic imagery and they focus on the stone hitting just the toes. But Daniel made it clear, the stone 
that was cut out with our hands. In other words, it didn't, it wasn't created by man, by the hands of men. This stone hit the image at its feet, which was part iron and part clay. It made a collision course. It struck this image. And notice what happened when it struck the image and collided with this image. Thou sawest, verse 34, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out with our hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. So it collided and made contact with this image at his feet, and it break the image to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors. Like dust, it was broke to pieces. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Wait a minute, here we go again. The stone, it says, became a great mountain. And that great mountain filled the earth. Now, how long did it take for the stone to become a mountain? And then how long does it take for a mountain to fill a whole earth? You see that the Bible's talking about the progression of time. From a seed to a tree, from a stone to a mountain, and then from a mountain to a mountain that covers the entire planet. Verse 36 teaches us, this is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the head of gold is the king of Babylon. You catching that? The head of gold is the king of Babylon, right? And after thee shall arise, verse 39, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So after Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom, which was, was of gold, once it collapsed, it was taken over by the Medes and the Persians. Now, when the Medes and the Persians empire expired, it was taken over by the Greeks. So the gold is Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. The silver is the Medes and Persians. And the brass, this is the Greek empire. And verse 40 teaches us there's another empire coming. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So the iron is the fourth kingdom. Who took over the Greeks? Rome. What was Rome known for? Iron. Even the Greeks during the reign of the Greeks and, and, and the growth of his empire, during the Bronze Age. Okay? So what we're reading about Gold, Babylon, silver, Medes and Persians, brass, the Greeks, and iron, the Romans. But wait a minute, we've we seen another, um, uh, not a metal, but clay. Verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. This fourth kingdom, it shall be divided. But there shall be in it 
of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, it shall be divided, it shall be weak and strong. Notice verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So we see here, thou, verse 44, whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. So it's not just the toes, but it's the feet and toes as part iron and part clay. Partly strong and partly broken. Because what began to happen to the Roman Empire, it began to be divided into ten uh, nation states, if you will. Now, Let's analyze this. He's explaining and interpreting, giving him the interpretation of the dream. Now, verse 44 is key. So we see this process of time. The Colossus itself. And I mean, it took centuries for the Colossus itself to be built. From gold to uh, silver to brass. To iron. Okay, we're talking over a thousand years. Okay, the Romans itself had a reign of almost 400 years or more. Then we're talking that the uh, Greeks, their reign was a couple of centuries. And the Medes and Persians and thus and such and thus and such. So we're talking about the Colossus itself being built time. So if it's taken centuries for the Colossus to be built when the stone hit the Colossus at the feet why you think all that's happening you ever consider how long that takes okay the initial impact then it breaks to pieces signifying the initial impact causes a crack in the Colossus but the time of the impact and the time of the Colossus breaking to pieces, how long is that? Will that take a year? Will that take six months? Will that take a month, a week, 24 hours? How long will it take for the initial impact to cause the Colossus to collapse and turn into dust like it is seen upon like shaft which is seen upon the threshing floors where the wind can blow it away. How long is that process? Notice the next part. And I'm telling you it's more than six months. I'm telling you that people have stumbled over the scriptures because they have not considered the process of time. So you think Yeshua didn't lie. You think the prophecies didn't come to pass. Because you, in your own mind, done made up partly how long it should take and how it should look. Jesus of Nazareth told the scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees, he said, from this time forward, you shall see the Son of Man coming with power. He said that before he was executed. Many people got their imaginations on how that looked, so they believe it didn't happen. They believe he lied. Yes, it happened. And just what he was describing... Once you understand what he was teaching, that's exactly what happened. From that time forward, they seen the Son of Man coming with power. But people don't quite understand what he meant. We got other teachings on what he meant. Just like he didn't understand what he meant, he said, let you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have no life in you. He told him the same thing. He said, look here. He said, look, I'm going to tell you this. If you believe on me and follow after me, you shall not taste of death. And they stumbled all over that and act a fool and they wondered, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean we believe on you? We'll never die. This is the same problem today. People are so damn arrogant and they think that they teachers and master teachers and they find themselves reproving the master teacher who teachings way over their head. They need to sit down at his feet and learn. But they're too arrogant for that. They know too much. 
but don't know much at all. And that's what happens when you really start to learn, you realize how much you don't know. And therefore you find out, I maybe wait a minute now, maybe I need to slow down and analyze some things. So now we're looking at this prophecy in the book of Daniel. We've seen a prophecy in a prophetic language of the parable of the mustard seed to a tree. Process of growth. Progression. Anybody who says that the kingdom of God isn't a progressing kingdom, they, 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 they probably don't know what they're talking about. Okay. So now we see the Colossus, that took centuries to build. From gold to iron. From iron to iron and clay took a couple of centuries for the process for the iron to turn into iron and clay. That took centuries. And so now the collision course of the stone being cut out with our hands, how long did that take? How long did it take for the stone to be cut out with our hands? And then when it collided against the Colossus iron and clay, how long did it take for that crack to uh, overtake this Colossus image and then the crack began to be so fragmented that it collapsed and then after the collapse it was ground down to such a powder that the wind can blow it away. How long all that stuff take? And once you start to sit down in consideration on what the Bible teaching then maybe our imaginations of things might change and, that, and, and we got to be careful of our imaginations you see because they imagined the Messiah to come one way when he came 2,000 years ago. But he came a way, he came in a way in which they didn't imagine. So the kingdom of God. How are you imagining it to come? How do you think it's going to appear? Will a man come out the sky? What is he talking about? We have ran so proud in our interpretation. And we could be leading many people astray. So what we have to do is go back and analyze the text. And I'm saying take it or leave it. I'm saying take something and take this into consideration. Now we see here that in verse 42, and as the toes of the feet, as he said in verse 41, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided of of iron and the kingdom shall be divided. Excuse me. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. We're going to find out what was going on in the Roman Empire, how it pretty much began to implode. All right? But verse 44 is important. In the days of these kings, Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed? Who shall set up the kingdom? The God of heaven. That's why he said the stone, which is the kingdom of God, is made with our hands. Because man didn't make it. God made it. The stone is the kingdom of God. Now you see how the kingdom of God, being the stone slash mustard seed, grew into a mountain that fills the whole earth slash the large tree that came forth from the mustard seed. So the kingdom of God from a stone to a mountain and a mountain that fills the whole earth. Progression. How long it take? If it took centuries for the Colossus to even come into an existence, how long will it take for the stone to grow into a mountain? This is the progression of the kingdom of God. And we're going to find out why, you know, it's important because everybody won't see the kingdom of God. They won't be able to perceive it. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In the days of what kings? He's explaining. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, 
but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. In the days of the fourth kingdom, not when it's iron, but in the days when the fourth kingdom is iron and clay, in those days, in the days of those kings of the fourth kingdom that shall reign when the kingdom is iron and clay. During those days, it says the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom. This is when he shall begin to form a kingdom or a stone cut out without hands. In those days. Now, you can argue with it if you want to. That's when he shall set up the kingdom. You understand? It won't be a mountain that fills the earth right away. It's going to be a stone first. It won't be a tree that housed the fowl of heaven right away. It's going to be a small mustard seed first. Inconspicuous. Small. Then it shall progress and grow and fill the earth. In the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. How long will the process be as the kingdom of God grows? And the other kingdom is degressing. As the kingdom of God progress, the other kingdom is degressing. It is collapsing. As the kingdom of God is growing, this other kingdom is turning into the dust which the wind shall drive away. Man, we're talking about time. And we have found ourselves lying and stumbling over with the prophets writing. All because of our misunderstanding of time and not taking into consideration what the book teaches. Now, let's see something here. Verse 45 reads, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. It shall surely happen. And I'm here to tell you, it is happening. Look, let's go look at something. Let's go look at something. Now, Jesus of Nazareth argues something here. If we take our time and we go into um, the book of John. The book of John. Turn your Bibles to the book of John. All right? And while we go into the book of John... Hold your markers in the book of John, and then I am going to go into some history. But we're going to go to the book of John and look at something, too. John chapter 3. Notice in John chapter 3. In fact, I'll read John 3 first, and then we'll go into some history. John the third chapter. We're going to look at that first, and then we're going to go into some history. So John chapter 3, starting at verse 1, it reads this. It reads, uh, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Here's another Israelite acknowledging the knowledges of this master teacher. And you got some guys running around here can barely speak English, blaspheming and talking against this master teacher. They got something coming. They're going to get gravel put in their mouth. Now look, he said, we know 
that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Daniel said that the kingdom of God was being established. It was the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. This was the God of heaven establishing the kingdom. Now, 2,000 years ago, this teacher is teaching us and teaching another teacher in Israel and telling him, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you look the word see up in Greek. He means to perceive. Because he didn't already said the kingdom of God is not coming with the observation like low here or low there. Because they didn't perceive it. We're going to read it a little later. later. They didn't perceive it. It's right here among you. Well, why did he argue it was among them? That mustard seeds, he was small. You didn't get it. You didn't understand it. It was small. You didn't perceive it. Right there among you. Let's go look at some history. But you must be born again in order to perceive it. Verse 5 says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First of all, if you're not born again, you can't even see it. And unless you are born of the water and of the Spirit, you can't even enter it. First of all, you won't be able to know where it is. You won't even know what it's about. You, you'll be off somewhere and all just way off. Your perception of it is off. you got to be born again to perceive it. And then once you're born again to perceive it, this process of regeneration, just as that takes time, maybe you will start to perceive that the kingdom of God takes time. But you will start to see it in its growth. Now, I want to go to some history here. And uh, I, I think it's fitting for us to go to a pictorial history of the Italian people by Salvadori. A pictorial history of the Italian people. We read about the Fourth Kingdom. The Fourth Kingdom is the Romans, if you didn't know. It is the Romans. Now, I want to go to page 36. Now, remember what was supposed to happen to this Fourth Kingdom? See, this fourth kingdom, according to Daniel, this fourth kingdom was to be, it was strong as iron, but it was to turn into iron and clay. Its feet was to become iron and clay. Strong as iron at one point, then it shall become partly weak and partly strong. And during the days of that kingdom, and the kings that shall reign while the kingdom is iron and clay during those days, during the days of those kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And the time of the feet of iron and clay, that lasted for centuries. For centuries was the iron and clay stage of the Roman Empire in existence. As we can argue, the last vestiges of it is still among us. So during those days, the God of heaven is setting up a kingdom. You understand where we're going with this? During those days, it's growing and progressing. It's going to fill the earth. It's going to Catch people off guard when the divine intervention fall in on the people because now the fullness is coming to fruition. Now we go into the pictorial history of the Italian people, page 36. Subtitle, Inequality Weakens the Republic. What? Inequality weakens the Republic. What did Daniel say? 
He told us in Daniel chapter 2. Chapter 2. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Just like toes are divided, is iron and clay, it shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is mixed with clay. Rome became a melting pot of all of the different sons of the world, of the different people of the world. But of bringing in all of the different people of the world, just like you see in America, it created inequality. So the Goths, the Hurali, the Vandals, and all of the different barbar so-called barbarians, as Rome was conquering the world, they were coming all into the kingdom. And there's a social science behind that too. Inequality. These people was hungry and looking for work. They were looking for jobs. They struggling against the feudal empire because they're trying to find justice and all in the meanwhile, inequality prevails and it weakened the republic. So the republic was iron and now history is teaching us that the republic of Rome was weakened. Let's see. Inequality weakens the republic. More important than conquest were internal changes. First, the transformation of the Roman Italian nation and later the transformation of the Roman Mediterranean world. There had been remarkable stability in the Roman Republican community for several hundred years. For several hundred years they said it was remarkable stability. This is the days of the iron. It's strength. It was stable and strong. Stability in the nation. This is when it was iron. But then as Daniel said, it shall turn into iron and clay. There have been problems, grave ones, and they have been solved without bloodshed and violence and a spirit of fairness and compromise. However serious unrest set, however serious unrest set in toward the end of the second century B.C. So for several hundred years, Rome was stable as iron according to Daniel. Then unrest and inequality begin to what? Weaken the republic. Towards the end of the second century B.C. So it's declining from iron and now starting to turn to iron and clay. Notice, the source of it was the, was the usual one in free societies. The source of it was inequality, it says. As the result of conquest, many Romans have become wealthier. At the same time, as the result of long wars and economic competition, from the dependencies, many Romans have become poor. Particularly the small farmers. To the growing gap between rich and poor in the Roman state were added the differences between not less than five classes of unequal citizens in the Roman Italian Confederation. See, politics again. That's why we at the Knesset deal with social uh, economic uh, issues because it is found all through the Bible. It's the reason why the iron turned into clay, but we got other lessons on it. Why the barbarians were uh, treated the way they were treated and oppressed under the feudal lords of the papacy. But we see history is revealing to us what the prophetic language is talking about. From iron and the stability for several hundred years to its decline toward the end of the second century BC. What was the reason? History says inequality. The gap between rich and poor began to grow and Rome began to be fragmented. Now it's turned to iron and clay. And we see that there were not only hostility because of the rich and poor gap between the Romans, 
but also it was a problem because of the five classes of unequal citizens in the Roman Italian Confederation. Discrimination between Rome and Romanized Italians on, on one side and subjects and the dependencies on the other and the presence of a large number of slaves. Liberty can stand just so much inequality and no more. Greater inequality was not applied to the conflicts between rich and poor. Excuse me. The solution applied to the conflict between patricians and plebeians, or the rich and the poor, between Romans and Latins in the 5th and 4th centuries, greater inequality was not applied to the conflicts between rich and poor, free men and slaves, citizens and subjects in the 2nd and 1st centuries. At first, there were riots when the conservative coalition of traditionalists, which are the patricians and prosperous members of the rapidly expanding business community, opposed the moderate reforms proposed in 133 B.C. So we're seeing because of the social unrest, Rome began to be weakened and divided, just like iron don't mix with clay. We're seeing the rich and poor, the social division, the social climate, that the society of Rome is no longer stable. But because of inequality, the rich and poor wasn't mixing, just like iron and clay don't. That's not it, though. If we look at this, let's go a little further. So, during the close of the 2nd century B.C., we see Rome tumbling down into, weak, into a weak republic. Now I want to turn uh, to page um, 41. Let's go down, jump in history. If you can find this book, a pictorial history of the Italian people. Uh, you could probably find it online and uh, get the same record. Now I want to turn to page 41. The Bible said during the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom on this earth. So while the Republic from the first century, end of the second century B.C., as it began to be weakened, we talk about several hundred years again. And all of the kings and rulers who's reigning in Rome during these days, the God of heaven is establishing the kingdom. These days, the God of heaven is establishing the kingdom. People say, oh, you say the kingdom of God is here. They don't know what to do. I'm going to show you something here. You ain't got to argue with me. I tell you all the time, that's why I'm a sharecropper's son. You understand? We plain. We plain cats. You understand? But those who you consider scholars, check them out. I'm reading what they write. And they're recording history. Page 41 of the Pictorial History of the Italian People reads, subtitle, From Tiberius to Alexander Servius. From Tiberius to Alexander Servius. So we're going down further into history. As the close of the first century BC. It says from Augustus on. The Roman state was called the empire. And its rulers were called emperors. So we got reigns of kings. And rulers in Rome. As it is uh, iron and clay. And it says, during the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall begin to establish a kingdom. So, they were called emperors. Octavian was given the title prince, princeps, or, quote, first citizen of Rome, unquote. And Peter Patrick, quote, father of the fatherland, unquote. The counselor commanded, or excuse me, the counselor command and the power of the tribune inherited from the Republican past when it was stable of iron 
gave legal sanction to the acts of Octavian and his successors, or the kings, in 12 BC, Octavian also became Pontiff Maximus, first pontiff, the highest religious authority. His immediate successors belonged to Caesar's Julian family, Tiberius, a good general and an efficient administrator was the ablest. So we got two names we don't pull it out. Octavian, who was Pontifex Maximus. He became the emperor. We talking about Octavian and Tiberius. So we're looking at Augustus. All the way down to Tiberius. Now let's go into our Bible because we're reading about kings from Augustus on, Octavian, then we 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 getting into uh, 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 Tiberius. We pulling some names out here, and these guys are beginning to be established in the at the end of the it's the close in 12 B.C. The end and the final chapters of the first century or the last century if you will of the BC era and during this time the prophets said the God of heaven will establish a kingdom on this earth now we got like let's see if the kingdom of God began to be established during Octavian and Tiberius now we turn our books to Luke the third chapter some very interesting things is written here. Luke, the third chapter. Turn your books to Luke, the third chapter. And when we get to Luke, the third chapter, I want us to pay some attention to what we're about to read here. Because Daniel said, during the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. He shall set it up. And what we learn is that the kingdom of God is progressing. From a mustard seed to a large tree. From a stone to a mountain to a mountain that fills the whole earth, a progression. And we've seen that the Colossus that Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of, it itself, even to be established, took centuries. Then we find that the iron, which is the Roman Empire, before it was mixed with clay, it, the iron stage of the Colossus lasted for several centuries. And now you have to ask yourself from the collision course of the stone hitting the Colossus at the feet, how long does it take for this Colossus to collapse? How long does it take from the stone to grow into a mountain and from a mountain to fill the whole earth? And we know that the stone began to grow at impact. And the impact was the stone hit the Colossus at the feet of iron and clay and during the days of the Colossus, when the uh, Colossus was made up of iron and clay, during the days of the feet, the God of heaven wanted to set up a kingdom on this earth. Now, during the days of iron and clay, we started to pull some names out. When the public Republic of Rome began to be weakened because of inequality, we see Augustus uh, all the way down to Tiberius. We see Octavian to Tiberius. Now look at this. In Luke the second chapter, or third chapter, verse 1. Now in the fifth year of the reign of who? Tiberius Caesar. It says Jesus of Nazareth was born during the days of Octavian. And then in the fifth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Eturia, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, so they grown men, 
and we done made it from Octavian down to Tiberius, it was promised by the prophets in the days of the kings when Rome or the fourth kingdom was part iron and part clay that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom on his earth. And this is what we see in so far the kings during the days of the fourth empire when it was iron and clay. And now we have John the Baptist in the wilderness. And what did John say? Verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Is that right? Let's go into uh, follow this up. Let's go into uh, Matthew the third chapter. Let's just follow this up with Matthew. During the days of Tiberius, one of the kings, while the fourth kingdom was iron and clay, this is more than a coincidence, is it? Got to be. Got to be. Now we go back to Matthew the third chapter. What do we find in verse 1? In those days came John the Baptist. What days was that? This was during the days of the Colossus image, during the days of the feet, when the Roman Empire was partly weak and partly strong. And this was during the days of one of those kings, Tiberius, whom history said from Octavian, who was Pontiff Maximus in 12 BC, became Pontiff Maximus and... His immediate successors belonged to the Caesar Julian family, Tiberius. A good general and an efficient administrator was the ablest. And we find out that he was he became Caesar, Tiberius. So during the days of these kings, what then happened? In the day, in those days, this is when Rome was weak and strong now. This is the iron and clay. John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh my goodness, it was being set up then. This is right with history and the prophecy. John, read it again. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 2 reads, And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's go into uh, uh, Mark chapter 1. Let's follow us up with Mark chapter 1. John said the kingdom of God is at hand. Notice carefully what you're going to see here in Mark the first chapter. Mark the first chapter. Notice very carefully how this is worded. John came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And now let's look at Jesus of Nazareth. Mark Chapter 1, verse 14 reads, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's being established. That's why. This is the mustard seed. This is the stone being cut out with our hands. And it's colliding against Rome. Now, after that, John was put in prison, verse 14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 15, notice this, take notice. Verse 15 reads, and saying, the time is fulfilled. Oh, boy, boy. The time is fulfilled. What time? Could it be talking about the time that Daniel was talking about? In the days of these kings, that the God of heaven set up a kingdom which should never be destroyed. The time is fulfilled, he says. The master teacher argues and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Hand, meaning it's at arm's reach. It's present. It's at hand. The time has been fulfilled. The time. I am arguing that Daniel the prophet prophesied of. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God is at hand during the time of the feet and clay, or the feet which was iron and clay. And this was the time that the prophet Daniel said in Daniel 
chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, it revealed to us the time is at hand. What time? Verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, which was Roman Empire was divided because of inequality, but there shall be in it the strength of iron, for but it still shall have strength, for as much as thou sawest iron makes of miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. That's what we was reading. The, the inequalities and the divisions of the Roman Empire between the rich and the poor, and the uh, five classes who was a part of the Roman Confederacy, they were all begin to be uh, to, to bring forth and gender dis dissension. And division. Now during those days. It says in verse 44 of Daniel chapter 2. And in the days of these kings. Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be not. And the kingdom shall not be left for another people. But it shall break in pieces. And consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. During these days. Iron and strong. I mean iron and clay. Weak and strong. What days? Days of Octavian, the days of Augustus, the days of, of Tiberius. The days of Tiberius is when Jesus of Nazareth and John the Baptist said the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus of Nazareth said the time is fulfilled. We read about it, people. Could it be, Acts, uh, that we're reading about this taking place, fulfilling Daniel's second chapter? History is verifying it. Now look at here. Look what he began to say. Uh, let's go into Luke the 17th chapter. The Luke 17th chapter. The process of time for the growth of the kingdom of God. We're telling you the seed been planted. The kingdom of God is here. But just as he said, you got to be born again to perceive it. People looking for the divine intervention. It's going to come when it comes. But we better be well rounded on what this kingdom is about because when the divine intervention interrupts, if we have been deceived and we've been looking at this the wrong way, it might not be no good news when he comes. That's why he said when he when it comes town down time as the kingdom began to reach the phases of judgment. He's he gonna tell I never knew you. If you don't even perceive the kingdom and know what the kingdom of God is about. You messed up. If you're trying to build and teach the gospel on hate, if you're trying to build and teach the gospel on all, any other thing, because you cannot perceive what the kingdom of God is made up of, you might be in some trouble. Better take your time. Now look, Daniel, I mean Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, he said, unless a man, is, uh, in, Luke, uh, in John chapter 3, he said, unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom. Now look, they had a problem then too, because they wanted to know, they asked the same question, Luke chapter 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. If we follow and prophesy everything right, it had arrived. It was there already, just like it is here now. They want to know when it's coming, just like the people want to know today when the kingdom of God coming. They looking in the sky somewhere. They looking for the divine intervention. The kingdom of God is here before the divine intervention. That's why he said when he come into his kingdom, he shall take out of his kingdom all who offend. The problem is the people got a, 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 a wrong idea of what the kingdom is because maybe they haven't been born again. You've got to be born again to even perceive the kingdom. And then you've got to be born of the water and the spirit to even enter the kingdom. 
And these people wanted to know the same question 2,000 years ago when the kingdom began to generate in the earth. Verse 20, and when was, and they asking him, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You don't get it. That's what he's telling them. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you or among you. It's generating right now. But you don't see it because you're not born again. That's what he was telling Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. Notice again, let's follow it back up. The Pharisees demanded when the kingdom of God shall come. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He wanted to know the same thing. And Jesus of Nazareth told him, uh, John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he's going to tell him the same thing because they want to know when it's coming. But Nicodemus wanted to know, really, what, how, what does this look like? And Jesus of Nazareth said in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This was the same argument he just told the, the uh, Pharisees who demanded of him in Luke 17 and 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he said, It cometh not with observation. Except the man be born again, he can't see the kingdom. It is right here among you. It had to be because Jesus of Nazareth said the time is fulfilled. And just like Daniel said, during the days of the empire of the fourth kingdom, during the reign of the kings where it was iron and clay, shall the God of heaven set up the kingdom. History revealed to us when Rome was weak or in the iron and clay stage of the prophecy of Daniel, it gave us names in history. Octavian, Tiberius. Then the Bible gave us names and named Tiberius. He was definitely one of the kings. Octavian was one of the kings. Jesus of Nazareth was born in those days, but they began the ministry in the days of Tiberius. And the kingdom of God began to grow all the way through the days of Nero, all the way through, all the way until today it continues to progress into the mountain that shall fill the earth. Now we need to know what it looked like. And people say, well, brother, man, look at here. It ain't came yet. I got news for you. We're going to end with this. Let's go and find out the, another teacher who they talk bad about because they don't understand his teachings. We're going to go to the book of Colossians. They talk bad about him because they, they don't know what he's talking about. He know, See, the, 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 the elders know what they're talking about. But the people today don't know what they're talking about. And they're running headlong in destruction because they're so proud. They refuse to humble themselves to the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. And hey, people going to do what they do. But Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians chapter 1, notice this. The apostle Saul began to explain. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy is our brother. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He said, listen, we are partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who hath delivered us, the Father hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translate means to be taken from one place to another. Paul just said that they have been transferred from the powers of Rome and the powers and the empires of the world, the powers of darkness, and they have been, not will be, but they have been translated into the kingdom of Mashiach. And we can read it in other places too, where John said the same thing. 
Paul seen the kingdom. He was born again and seen it. People say, well, you ain't born again yet. We got other teachings to show you. Yeah, yes, you are. Okay. But that's not today. Paul said he had been translated. Him and his other comrades had been translated into the kingdom of the Messiah. And who are you to say they ain't come yet? So far, we done read it began to be established during the days of the Roman Empire, during the days when the weak and strong. And I'm here to tell you that the kingdom of God is growing to this day. And unless a man born again, he cannot see it. So our goal is to be born again so we can perceive it and then born of the water and born of the spirit so we can enter it. Because the earth shall be given to those who enter and they shall possess this earth forever and ever. And they shall bring justice and they shall all reign when the powers of Rome and the last vestiges of the empires collapse and be blown away. And the kingdom of God is going to fill this earth, that mighty mountain. We're going to close out for today's discussion. If you have any questions or comments, call the number that's been appearing on your screen. If you are interested in our Bible study classes, contact us. If you are interested in setting up a Bible study class in your area and you want to help the NMP grow and you want to spread the message, call the number that's appearing on your screen. Don't hesitate. And with that, we're going to close out until the next time. We we'll say peace in the name of the Hamashiach. Peace in the name of HaMashiach. For all of you who are sincerely searching. Shalom.